Right, let's pray together. Give me life according to your word. Father, we thank you for your life-giving, living word, that it, in it and through it you work within us, that you are alive, that your word is active, and that you are amongst us as your word is taught and read and considered. And so we pray that you would give us life, refresh us, we pray, through your living word, in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to read from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, through to 3, verse 13. And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. For you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out, and displeased God and opposed all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved, so as always to fill up the measure of their sins. But God's wrath has come upon them at last. But since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, In person, not in heart, we endeavoured the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face, because we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and joy. Therefore, when we could bear it no longer... We were willing to be left behind at Athens alone, and we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ, to establish and exhort you in your faith, that no one be moved by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are destined for this. For when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction, just as it has come to pass, and just as you know. For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith, for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labour would be in vain. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith and love and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you. For this reason, brothers, in all our distress and affliction, We have been comforted about you through your faith. For now we live if you are standing fast in the Lord. For what thanksgiving can we return to God for you, for all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God, as we pray most earnestly night and day that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, as we do for you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. I mentioned yesterday that Paul's normal practice, having sown the seed of the gospel, was to return subsequently, again and again, to see the church established. Acts chapter 14, verse 22, he returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples. That's the word rooting the souls or establishing the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith 
and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Now, as you know, that pattern is repeated across Acts, and Paul's so-called missionary journeys could equally be described as church-building journeys. He planted the seed of God's word. He built the church. And the language of establishing or strengthening, encouraging and urging, and the talk of tribulation or affliction through which we enter the kingdom is all across 1 Thessalonians. It, I can't emphasize how often you hear that language through the letter. With the church in Thessalonica, Paul had been unable to follow through his usual pattern of revisiting. Blocked from returning, he sent Timothy, and Timothy himself was sent to establish and encourage the church, same words, same, same pattern, same behavior, in the face of the affliction that they were facing. And on Timothy's return, Paul then writes this letter. So my suggestion is that what we have here is, if you like, the blueprint of what Paul did, said, and taught uh, as he went to visit these churches, though he could not himself be there in person in this case because he'd been prevented. I'm not especially persuaded that there is a great defense of Paul's ministry as if there's some unmentioned group pouring scorn on Paul's time in Thessalonica. The commentators seem to make much of it, but Paul doesn't really mention it. I wonder if it's a bit of a case of mirror reading. Nor do I see a huge amount of evidence in the second half of the letter of Paul addressing specific issues of concern raised by Timothy on his return. Much more, it seems to be, normal material that Paul covered on his return visits. Now, Gwilym's done some very useful work on this, on the parallels between 1 Corinthians and 1 Thessalonians. And together, I think we would suggest that this is much more a template of the standard sort of ministry that Paul exercised in order to establish the church. It makes 1 Thessalonians then, well, like all letters, but such an essential tool for us as we engage, so many of you in revitalizing, planting, and so forth, and getting going and keeping going local churches. In this part of the letter, uh, that uh, you might say um, 1 Thessalonians is far more applicable than perhaps I had realized before I started studying it last August. We should be reading it one-to-one -one with young Christians. It should be part of our basic discipleship material, perhaps. We could study it in a new church plant or with the Christianity Explored group as a next step. Uh, and we saw yesterday, here is the authentic church, chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. And here is the genuine gospel ministry, chapter 2, verses 1 to 12, that saw that church established. This is the reason for Paul's thanksgiving in chapter 1, verse 2. And it extends right the way through as we saw to chapter 2, verse 12. Now we have chapter 2, verse 13, which begins... And we also thank God constantly for this. It's a fresh cause of thanksgiving. And then chapter 4, verse 1 through to chapter 5, is how we should now live, given that we are seeking to stand firm for the day of Christ and his return. That then leaves us the material we're going to look at now, verse 13 of chapter 2 through to verse 13 of chapter 3. And in this part of the letter, I'm persuaded that Paul is telling the Thessalonians why he is so convinced, following the return of Timothy, that things are going well with them. It's his second big prayer of thanks. And having said, we also give thanks, he then explains the reason why. And 2.8, if you wanted a summary verse, does well for us, for now we, sorry, 3.8, for now we live 
if you are standing fast in the Lord. That's quite a statement, isn't it, to think of our particular charge that we've been given in our particular area of work. Now I live if St. Helens is standing fast in the Lord. It's quite a challenge, quite a charge. But what are the marks of the Christian church that is standing firm in the gospel? And I think we can summarize them really in three areas. And this is quite a good plumb line to hold up, isn't it, against ourselves individually? Whatever little work it is we're involved in, perhaps in a small group, the church in which we're serving as a whole. They accept the apostolic word. They see it for what it is, chapter 2, verse 13. They expect the world's opposition. They see it for what it is. Chapter 2, verse 14 through 16. And the last one, which I think is um, the one which has most struck and challenged me in my own personal thinking, which I have wrestled with um, very acutely for the last months, they embrace the apostles' work and see it for what it is. This is how we know there's a work of God going on. It's God's work, the apostolic word. We also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the words of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. It's described, this verse, by one author as an unambiguous assertion that the gospel Paul preached was the word of God. Uh, We're used to such a statement from the Old Testament prophets, thus says the Lord. We see it with the Lord Jesus, the one who is from above speaks what he has seen. I am the way, the truth, and the life. The apostles are commissioned... He will lead you into all truth. Here the Apostle Paul makes the exact same claim for his own teaching. You heard from us the word of God. You accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God. Paul doesn't rebuke the Thessalonians for regarding his teaching too highly. He commends the Thessalonians for recognizing his words for what it is, the very word of God. He was sent by God. He had a message from God. He spoke with the authority of God. Do we want to hear God speak today? Listen to the Apostle Paul. Do we want to know God's view on a matter? Study the writings of the Apostle. Do we seek access to foundational truths that govern our universe? Here we find them. But not only did they receive the word, they also experienced its power within themselves. Again, those two two two-letter words, which is at work in. Now, is, obviously, is a present tense. In is internal. Paul spoke to them and left. The word went on working. Paul left them with the word. The word went on working. The word is God's word. God's word is at work within you. The word goes on working. Now, of course, we find this across the New Testament. The flesh counts for nothing. The spirit gives life. The word I have spoken to you, the words are our spirit. They are life. These very words are spirit. They are life. Now I commend you to the word of his grace, which is able to keep you and give you an inheritance among all the saints. The word of God is living and active. I think we find this hard to get hold of. We forget this truth because we are mortal and our words are ephemeral. You know, can we remember what our children or our spouse or some friend or our boss said to us yesterday morning? Can we even remember what we said to ourselves this morning? I have to write lists. My words are largely impotent, I find. But God is everlasting. 
His word spoken in history stands for eternity. His word uttered yesterday has power today and forever. Heaven and earth will pass away. My words will never pass away. God is immortal, all-powerful. God is everywhere. And God's everlasting word stands for all time with power to accomplish in each and every present moment precisely what his intention was as he spoke it. My words shall not return to me empty. Do we believe this? It's an extraordinary statement, isn't it? In 19, when I was at university back in the Dark Ages, one of the little books that we all uh, loved because it was so, I mean, relatively unspoken was F.F. F. Bruce, New Testament Documents, Are They Reliable? It was actually published, you probably know this, in 1943. And it was like a blast of refresh. I mean, I wasn't at university in 1943. I just want to get that, get that absolutely clear. Some of you think, oh yeah, was it, was it really then? I thought it was the 1930s. No. no. Uh, and um, it was published in 1943. Of course, we live, and we forget this, at the back end of 150 years of liberal skepticism with regard to the word of God coming out of the Enlightenment and the German rationalists. And for F.F. Bruce to publish this book, it swept like wildfire across the universities and was still being used in the late 70s and 80s when I was at university. It was the thing long before we had Peter Williams and so forth. Well worth reading even today. But recently F.F. Bruce's biography was published. I say recently, I think it was about 10 years ago. And reading F.F. F. Bruce's biography is so interesting because, of course, he was asked to speak on this everywhere, the reliability of the New Testament documents. But eventually, he refused to go on speaking about it. He just wouldn't speak on this because he said the New Testament documents speak for themselves. Rather like J.B. Phillips, you know, they are alive. It's God speaking. Uh, like Spurgeon, defend God's word, I'd sooner defend a lion. God's word is at work among you. I still try to read the Bible rather hopelessly with a number of individuals. I've got five or six at the moment, and I read with them on a sort of fortnightly or three-weekly basis whenever I can get hold of them. But I'll sometimes say to them, how many people are there in the room? when there are just me and the person I'm reading with. And of course, they look at me as if I'm absolutely batty. Three. Or or somebody might like to say five. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. (laughs) How many people are there with us now? The Lord is amongst us because his word is being taught. Here is the first mark then of a church that is standing, established, Paul rejoices, now I live if you are standing fast in the Lord. And you are standing fast in the Lord. We thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, you heard from us, you accept it not as the word of men, but as the word truly is, the word of God, which is at work in you. Believers. I think of Mark Baker, who was not an associate. He was back in the old days when associates were called, most incorrectly and inappropriately, a different name. And he's now down in Quay, in far west of Cornwall, where marrying your cousin is considered a brave thing to do. And Sorry, it's where I come from. That's why I say that. But... uh, (laughs) Um, But down there, I remember him saying, you know, the word, the Bible, is not just on the seats or in the pew, it's now in the driving seat, the word which is at work among you. I often ask when I go and visit a church, where do they think the power lies? In the experience that is produced by the word of God or in the word of God that produces the experience? If it's the former, Everything will be about, you know, the light shows and the smoke things and all the rest of it, producing the music, producing the experience. If it's the latter, the word of God, everything will be about the word of God and the experience will flow. 
Do they believe the power lies in the community or in the word of God that produces authentic community? Do they believe the power lies in addressing deepest personal needs or in the word of God that addresses deepest personal needs? Secondly, they stand in the face of opposition from the world and understand it for what it is. Now, from verses 14 through 16, Paul identifies, I think, at least seven different marks of the world's opposition towards the Thessalonians and all Christian believers. It's key to recognize that what Paul is saying here is not designed to be anti-Semitic. I'm not going to spend long on this. I think the commentaries rightly spend a long time on it. But the danger is, by spending so long on that which needs to be addressed, we miss what Paul is actually seeking to do. Paul describes the opposition he has faced across the Mediterranean, and particularly the opposition which was experienced by Jewish Christians from the Jews in Judea. The opposition has come from the Jews and was originally experienced in Judea. And when Paul writes, God's wrath has come upon them at last, he's not saying, ha ha, phew, they got it coming to them and now it's landed. Remember RML Romans, my heart's desire and prayer for them is that they may be saved. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. I wish I myself were cut off and accursed for the sake of my kinsmen. Now, what Paul is doing is describing the Jewish hostility, which is paradigmatic, typical of the hostility which the Thessalonians themselves are now facing, not from the Jews. They are facing hostility from their own countrymen. That's what the text says. Look at verse 14. For you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that in Judea, for you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews. (laughs) To suggest that what they were suffering remains as coming from the Jews now is to completely misread the text. What Paul then does is to explain what came from the Jews and how anti-God it was in order so that the Thessalonians can then understand the world's opposition that they are facing now from Gentiles and understand it for what it is and stand in the face of it. So this opposition was against Jesus. They killed both the Lord Jesus It is against those who speak the message of Jesus and the prophets and drove us out. This opposition displeases God. It displeases God. And it is anti-humanitarian. It opposes all humanity by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved. It is sinful. It fills up the measure of sin. And it comes under the judgment of God And it is normal you're experiencing from your own countrymen what they experienced from the Jews. Paul then is recording the hostility of the Jews to his message to show the Thessalonians the nature of hostile opposition. The Thessalonians are not experienced Jewish Jewish opposition. The hostility is coming from the Gentiles. It's important that they realize that these things about it, it displeases God. It is against the well-being of humanity. It is wicked, and it will come under judgment. It's great that there's no small print, isn't it? There's no hidden clause in the contract. This has been the experience of Christians all down the ages. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. By their unrighteousness, people suppress the truth. And if we were to go round table by table by table by table, we would have stories of hostile opposition to the truth of God's word that, it is, a, that is fundamentally against the well-being 
and flourishing of humanity that displeases God, that comes under judgment, that will face the wrath of God that is sinful. Now, I feel something of a fraud talking about this. I said to Dick last week, we've got all these people coming back, and it's wonderful. We're going to be looking at 1 Thessalonians. Hope to, he said, oh, brother, well, we're slight frauds on this, aren't we? Because really, we've started things from scratch, and you've taken over something that was already running, and these people who are coming have had to carve stuff out of the rock. And I know you have. I mean, we've experienced a tiny bit of it, I suppose, with the trying to start the Fleet Street work when we were turfed out of St. Dunstan's. But it was such an encouragement to me then to come across the biography of William Romain, who in the 18th century was himself thrown out of St. Dunstan's and then given only one hour a week to preach. And the vicar wouldn't light the church. And so the congregation had tapers in their hands, I mean, would the risk register allow this today? And he was preaching from a candle in that pulpit. Nothing new. There is no such thing as a day when the opposition to the gospel from the world will cease. I sometimes think, oh, well, surely there was a day once. And surely if we win the kind of cultural battle, everyone will welcome the gospel. No, no, it has never, ever happened, and it never will. You became imitators of the church of God in Christ. You suffered the same things from your own countrymen. But it's anti-human, and it's anti the well-being of humanity, and it's fundamentally anti the purposes of God and the salvation of the bride of Christ by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved. Of course it is. What is the gospel? That God is love. God so loved the world. What does the gospel bring? Loving communities. We know that. To oppose the gospel is anti-human flourishing. It's important we realize that whatever opposition we're currently facing. I think of the city here, my word is my bond, in utmost good faith. Those are fundamentally Christian realities, integrity. To oppose the gospel, as so many of the HR departments seek to close down the preaching of the gospel, is fundamentally against good business. Above all, it's against God's purpose in the calling together of his people and the glorious purpose of God from the opening chapters of Genesis to the closing chapters of Revelation, to save men and women from every nation as a people for himself. What is this affliction that you're currently facing? What is it that the congregation that we're serving need to know about this affliction? That it is normal, that it's against Jesus, that it's against the spread of the glorious gospel which is so good for humanity in eternity and in the present, that it displeases God, that it is sinful, that it comes under the judgment of God. And of course, vital that Thessalonians know this about the Jewish opposition of the gospel for all the reasons uh, with regard to um, God and the consistency of his word and so forth. Now, of course, this does not give us a license to be obnoxious prats. I I know none of you are. And say, oh, well, there's going to be opposition. I'll just be obnoxious. I think I've been in danger of that at times. But it does help us, doesn't it, to understand the opposition that we face. The third sign of health, indicating that these Thessalonian brothers and sisters truly are standing firm comes in chapter 2, verse 17, to chapter 3, verse 10. And this piece has been, I think, to me, the biggest revelation, the greatest challenge, and I think it's the thing I'm least solid on. So I'd be glad of any um, input that you might have after this talk. It contains one of the most heartfelt, passionate, emotive descriptions the apostles' work and desire in all of the New Testament. I don't even think that two Corinthians can rival it. 
Let me just point out some of the features. His love for them. Having to leave them, he describes as being orphaned from them in verse 17. We were torn away. We were torn away in person, but not in heart, verse 17. We endeavored the more eagerly to see you again. Verse 1, when we could bear it no longer. Verse 5, when we could bear it no longer. And then verse 19 of chapter 2, what is our hope, our joy, our crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus is coming? Is it not you? You are our glory and our joy. Paul's not writing about his wife or his daughter. He's writing about other believers where he'd been for a few months preaching the gospel. One businessman said to me, they are his KPI. Now, KPI, it's not a form of peanut. It's a key performance indicator. That's a lovely business guy's way of taking it. The church, they are his KPI. And then somebody else in the room, slightly more uh, uh, acute. Actually, they're his bonus. You are my crown of boasting before the Lord. I'm not sure that's quite appropriate. As I say, this has been a profound challenge to me. Do I see the people of St. Helens like this? Or the churches that have been formed, um, that we've been involved in in any sort of way like this? You are our joy. Remember, it's not just the apostle. It's the apostle and Timothy and Silas. They're all writing together. Our joy, our crown of boasting, our hope, our glory. Another feature, so there's one feature of this piece. Another feature of this piece is the presence of Satan throughout it. No surprise if we understand what this piece is really about, the bride of Christ. Did you notice the presence of Satan throughout it? Verse 18 of chapter 2, I, Paul, again and again tried to come and see you, but Satan hindered us. And then chapter 3, verse 5, for this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor had been in vain. So another feature there is Satan. We see him throughout this piece that whilst Paul has this exalted, glorious image of the people of God, in chapter 3, verse 13, the saints who will come with the Lord Jesus at his return. He has this vision for all the people of God. There's constant reality of Satan having at him, trying to prevent the advance of the gospel and the gospel work. And another feature, which I think is the thing that has most helped me, is there in chapter 3, verse 6. Such a striking little phrase here that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us the gospel of your faith and love and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us. It's the only place in the New Testament where the word gospel is used other than to speak about the work of the Lord Jesus in salvation. There's one possible reference in Hebrews. Could it just be that to the Apostle Paul, so wrapped up in the eternal purposes of God to call together a people for himself, that news of gospel advance is to him as gospel? Again, this is a great challenge and encouragement to, to me to think rightly about the people of God. Here's Ernest Best. I think it's quite a helpful commentary. May not then the news which he received from Thessalonica be a preaching of the gospel to himself. From it results encouragement, life, joy. All these are normal products of gospel preaching. If the establishment and maintenance of a congregation is God's activity... It is a preaching of the gospel, the gospel to be told of this as much as it is to be told of his activity in the Old Testament. Very striking. Do I see God's eternal purposes in gathering together a people, you know, in Southampton 
or in Newcastle, or in Norwich, or wherever it happens to be, or in Uganda, or in Kenya, or in Cambodia, as part of this great gospel work, such that when we hear news of one another's work and the advance of the gospel, it is as gospel to us. Opposed by Satan, absolutely opposed by Satan. Constant battle, but true just gospel joy in the advance of the gospel. And that makes sense then of verses 7 and 8. Oh, verse 6, 7, and 8. The good news of your faith and love and reported that you always remember us kindly and you long to see us as we long to see you. For this reason, brothers, in all our distress and affliction, we have been comforted about you through your faith. So here is this third mark, if you like, that the Thessalonians are standing, that they are understanding the work of the apostle in the advance of the gospel and seeing it for what it is, true work of God and gospel advance, and they embrace it. They embrace it. So our three marks, they see the word of God for what it is. They see the opposition of the world for what it is. They see the church of Christ, the work of God, for what it is truly is. And Paul's assurance of the stability, health, maturity, and ongoing faithfulness of this Thessalonian church is tightly tied to Paul's assurance that this Thessalonian church continues to embrace these three things. It's challenged me in my thinking about the church and how I think about you guys and the advance of the gospel in London and the work at St. Helens. You are my joy, my glory, my hope. I spoke yesterday of victory celebrations. I've never been in one of those big victory celebrations and the um, open top bus and all that sort of stuff. I mean, as a an observer. I've never been in one of those. I've seen them on the telly. Perhaps you have. There are a few people, Manchester, old Manchester United fans, you used to have it. Manchester City last summer, obviously, at Chelsea from time to time. Are we talking about a victory celebration or are we talking about the bride of Christ? Paul's prayer is that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. I think we're talking about the bride of Christ, the return of Christ, and the great gospel purpose of our glorious God. Let me lead us in prayer. Please, Lord, would you give to each one of us such a vision and view of what it is you are doing in eternity, gathering a people for the Lord Jesus, that like Paul and Timothy and Silas, our whole sense of value and delight would be wrapped up in what you are doing amongst your people. Please correct us, help us to correct ourselves where other things have crept in. Grant us this right view of your living word which is at work amongst us. We pray that you would continue to work in us and help us in all the afflictions that we face by your grace and kindness to stand firm. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.